Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And you can always uh, give us a call, 208-991-4783. Well, before we get started with today's show... Uh, I do want to remind you, if you have not already, please check out our book, Tales of the Dim Night. It's a fascinating superhero comedy with a strong family element. You have a lot of fun, and it's a pretty entertaining book. You can check it out at dimnight.com. That's dimnight.com. Today, we're going to, uh, as we bring you our 350th episode special, uh, we're going to take a look at the radio production of a film that is definitely out of print and has never been released uh, in the current medium of DVD. It's a story starring Peter Lorre as our hero, which uh, is somewhat rare, as usually he's a sinister character of some sort, with Sidney Greenstreet as a his companion and the films and radio productions heavy. This episode uh, comes from the Screen Guild Theater, so it's half an hour. It is from April 16th of 1945. So let's go ahead and take a listen to The Mask of Dimitros. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Lady Esther Screen Guild play tonight, The Mask of Demetrius. The starring players... This is Sidney Greenstreet. And this is Peter Laurie. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in an intriguing story of drama, suspense, and murder. The Mask of Demetrius, based on the Warner Brothers picture. It stars Peter Lorre as Professor Lydon and Sidney Greenstreet as Eric Peters. Even now, when I know the whole story, it's difficult to believe it all happened to me. But one must make a start, I suppose. So just for a beginning, let's put down a date. Istanbul, Turkey, 1938. A woman strolling along the beach approaches some jetsam cast up by the sea. She glances at the little mound turns half away, turns suddenly back to it, and... Nothing else on the body, Colonel Hackey. The identification card, that's all. Thank you, Sergeant. Demetrius Macropolis. And now, at last, the case is officially closed. So it might have been. The case of Demetrius might have been closed. Only that very afternoon at a little party in Istanbul, I was introduced to Colonel Haki, chief of the Turkish secret police. A pleasure, sir, to meet you at last. <laughs> so you're the famous Professor Leibniz. Oh, please, not so famous and no longer a professor. I've been retired. <laughs> well, how fortunate. Now you can devote yourself to your writing, to your murder mysteries, huh? Well, possibly, if I can find material. Material? The world's full of it. Why, just today, I... Tell me, have you ever heard of Demetrius? Demetrius. That was the first time I ever heard his name. Demetrius Macropolis. He sometimes called himself Demetrius Talat. A spy, an assassin, a murderer, hunted by every policeman in Europe. 
but never once taken into custody. It was a strange tale that Colonel Hack he wove, a story he claimed that had no ending. But I protested the story was ended. Demetrius was dead. He was lying in a morgue that very moment. Whereupon the colonel smiled and suggested we go down and make sure. On this slab, Colonel, this is Demetrius. Oh, yes, thanks. Hmm. Ugly devil, isn't he, Mr. Lydon? Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm no judge. I, I never looked at a dead man before. <laughs> well, this ought to satisfy you for a while. Ah, what a pity that mouth will never talk again. There's still so much I'd like to know. For 16 years, ever since that day in Smyrna, it was my hope to get him. And now I have him. Spewed up by the sea in a cheap, shoddy suit. Dead by stabbing. <laughs> uh, Mr. Lydon, would you care to see the wound? No, I, I, I don't think so, Colonel. <laughs> Had enough, huh? Yes, quite enough. It wasn't true. I hadn't had enough. That night in my hotel room, trying to sleep my mind, was full of Demetrius. What a character, I thought. What a story he would make. If I could root out the things the police never knew. In Smyrna, in Sofia, in Belgrade, and Paris. There must be people who knew him. All over Europe, there must be people. And oh, then I told myself, no, no, this the thing is foolish. It's, it's unthinkable. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. But, but even as my mind rejected it, my... My hand reached out for the telephone. Good evening. Yes, this is the desk clerk. Mr. Lydon? Oh, yes, sir. Ticket to Smyrna for tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. I'll take care of it at once. You're welcome, sir. Good night. I beg your pardon? <clears throat> oh, yes, sir. Is Mr. Constantine Gullis staying at this hotel? Gullis? No, sir. No one by that name. Thank you. Sorry I've troubled you. No trouble, sir. We're never busy at this hour. I was just reading about this Murder?? Murder? Demetrius Macropolis. They found him on the beach. Demetrius? Yes, sir. Did you know him, sir? No. No, it's just that... Thank you very much. Good night. Are you sure? Are you positive? Well, you can look around the morgue yourself, sir. Not a body in the place. The paper said this man named Demetrius. Oh, him. He's gone. <sighs> yes. Cremated. About an hour ago. That man. That man whose life was to cross my own so strangely. I didn't know about him then. I had no hint of him until I got to Smyrna. I understand what you wish, Mr. Lyman. I will get it for you. <laughs> You're sure you know exactly what I want? But of course... In 1922, a certain comrade, a moneylender, is stabbed to death. Uh -huh. A man named Driss Abdul is charged with the crime. That's right. But he goes to his death blaming another man, a certain Demetrius. You wish the records of the trial. Are you sure you can get them? For 500 piastres? <laughs> I have them. You have them? Right here, my friend. But how? A month ago, a certain man comes to me. Yeah. He asks me to get them for him. He pays me well. Why didn't you tell me? You did not ask. Well, what was he like? Can you describe him? How did he talk? Like an Englishman, perhaps. Hmm. Or maybe a Frenchman. Or an American. Who knows? I didn't think much about it then. By now, there was only one thing in my mind. To follow that crooked trail... Through the years, from Istanbul to Smyrna, from Smyrna to Athens, and from there to Sofia. It was on a train just before we got in. As it happened, I was all alone. I beg your pardon. I must apologize for intruding. My compartment was so very crowded. Oh, that's quite all right. Plenty of room in here. How good of you to put it that way. I'm sure we'll have a very pleasant journey. Oh, well, uh, 
a rather short one, I'm afraid. I'm I'm getting off in Sofia. Oh, that's too bad. I'm going through to Bucharest. Oh. If I may introduce myself, my name is Peters. Peters. I would guess you're English. By birth, perhaps. But actually, I'm a citizen of the world. To me, all languages are beautiful. Oh, yes, if, if one says the right thing. We're coming into Sofia, sir. I'll take your bag. Oh, thank you, Porter. You like Sofia? Thank you. Beautiful city. The best hotel is the Slavyanska Basada. I hope you don't mind my suggesting it. Oh, please, to the country, you're very kind. Not at all. That's the trouble with this world. There's not enough kindness. Well, I believe you're helping to remedy that deficiency. Goodbye, Mr. Peters. Goodbye, Mr. Lighton. Goodbye. Hmm. Curious sort of fellow. He are. That's funny. How did he know my name? Even then, I didn't guess the truth. Oh, I, I wondered about Mr. Peters, of course, but I was more concerned with Demetrius. And in Sophia, there was a good deal to be learned. Demetrius, the petty thief. Demetrius, the thug. Demetrius, the blackmailer. Old newspaper files, police court records. I searched them all. And at last, they took me to Madame Irana. Irana at the cafe of the Golden Fez. She was sullen at first. Suspicious. Resentful. But when I told her that Demetrius was dead, she... Dead? It was very hard to believe. Well, I, I saw his body myself. How did he look? Oh, his hair was gray, his clothes were old, and rather cheap. So he didn't become rich after all. <laughs> Not even with my thousand francs. A thousand francs from you? I gave them to him. It was that afternoon. He rushed into my room. He was very excited. He made me promise if the police came, I'd swear he'd been with me all day. Oh, yes, I, I've seen the records. I, I know they question you. Isn't that the day the Prime Minister was killed? Demetrius? I never knew for sure. He told me he needed a thousand francs to get away. But once he reached Belgrade, he'd be very rich. He'd send for me. And did he send for you? I never heard from him again. Oh, all these years, it wasn't just a thousand francs. I understand. You were in love with him. A liar. Thief, an assassin, perhaps. But still, I... Uh, Madame Mirana, I've troubled you enough for one evening. You've helped me with, uh, really a great deal with my story. Possibly if you think, if you think of something else, I... If I think of something else. I'll be at my hotel, the Slavyanska Bizarre. <laughs> Clark, I didn't realize it was so late. You're a little early, Mr. Lydon. Huh? The... Peters. Will you close the door, please? Huh? Considering this gun in my hand, that becomes an order, not a request. Now then. Hey, what does this mean? What are you doing in my room? Why have you been going through, through my things? Don't move, please. Better. Now, Mr. Leighton, let us be frank with each other. And I propose to start with your answering a question. Why are you interested in Demetrius? Demetrius? Yes, dear Mr. Leighton. From Istanbul to Smyrna. From Smyrna to Athens. From Athens to Sofia. You have been absorbed in tracing his record. You see, I have observed you rather closely. No doubt. You haven't answered my question. I have nothing to hide. I, I'm interested in Demetrius as a character, as a basis of a, of a book. And I may write a detective story. A detective story? How fascinating. And now perhaps uh, you'll answer a simple question, Mr. Peters. What is your interest in Demetrius? Did you ever know him? Mr. Leiden, I do not recollect that I promised to give you any information. Well, then I have to show, to guess the answers. Is your interest money, perhaps? 
The treasure Demetrius had left somewhere, huh? Oh, no, no. No, when I think of him lying in a morgue, just, just that shabby suit, not a penny on him, I, I am forced to... What's the matter? Did I understand you to say that Demetrius is in a morgue? Yes, yeah, so what of it? Mr. Leiden, it occurs to me that we can be of great help to each other. What did you say if I proposed an alliance? An alliance? For what? I take it you're not a rich man, Mr. Leiden. No, I'm not rich. You can be very easily if you will meet me in Paris. Why on earth should I go to Paris? Shall we say to learn the whole story of Demetrius? Hmm? Mr. Leiden, I'm aware of certain facts which I cannot reveal to you at the moment. You, on the other hand, possess an important piece of information. You may not know it is important, but nevertheless, it is. But how will that make me rich? Added to what I already know, it is worth, at the very least, a million French francs. A million francs? A million francs. Mr. Leiden, shall I have the pleasure of seeing you in Paris? The second act of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play will follow in just a moment. Now, a word from Lady Esther. Often it's just some one little thing about your appearance that makes a difference between lack of confidence in yourself and complete poise and assurance. For example, you may have a dry, rough skin on which face powder looks all ruffled up and flaky. That can disturb your entire personality and just when you want to be at your best. So here's what I'd like you to do before powdering. It will make a wonderful change in your appearance. will give you marvelous new confidence in yourself. Just rub Lady Esther face cream on your skin and then wipe it off, gently but completely. You see, Lady Esther face cream loosens the dry, clinging particles of skin nature is trying to throw off. And when you wipe off the cream, along with it come all those rough little flakes, leaving only the new young skin, which is smooth as velvet. And on this new skin... Your powder takes on a fresh, vibrant look. A clear, translucent look. Now, if you want proof of all this, make the patch test. Just rub Lady Esther face cream on one side of your face. Wipe it off and apply your powder. Then compare that side of your face with the other. Feel the difference with your fingertips and see the difference in your mirror. Remember, all that counts in the use of any face cream is results. That's why I ask you to make the patch test and compare results with those from any cream you've ever used, regardless of price. Get a jar of Lady Esther face cream tonight if you possibly can. You'll find it wherever good cosmetics are sold. Lady Esther presents the second act of The Mask of Demetrius, starring Sidney Greenstreet and Peter Lorre, who continues our story. Yes, I did go to Paris. Quite eagerly, in fact. The story of Demetrius had grown beyond anything I dared to imagine. I knew that now I could never drop it until I had discovered the end. So I arrived, and after a busy 24 hours, I telephoned Peters that I was there. <laughs> I must give him credit. He wasted no time. Within the hour, he was at my hotel. My dear Mr. Leiden, I cannot tell you how glad I am to see you. Glad enough uh, to leave your gun at home? <laughs> But of course. Oh, that's good. Permits me to speak more freely, Mr. Peterson. Peterson? You know about that? Oh, yes, and more. Your, your name is Eric Peterson. You belong to a smuggling gang organized here in Paris by Demetrius. You were arrested in December 1931, fined 2,000 francs, and sentenced to one month imprisonment. Who told you that? Oh, no, well, I, I dug that out for myself. Old newspaper files are very interesting. Well, yesterday I found this story and this picture of you. Oh, yes, that picture. Not very flattering, is it? 
Oh, well, we are not discussing photography, Mr. Peterson. Please. The name is Peters now. All right, then. Peters. You know, in Istanbul, I, I was told that Demetrius betrayed a lot of you to the police in order to ensure his own escape. Is that true? Demetrius behaved very badly to us all. Oh, yes. And there was talk of vengeance. You all threatened to kill him as soon as you were free. I did not threaten him. Some of the others, perhaps. Oh. Constantine Gullis was always a hothead. Oh, I see. You did not threaten. You you preferred to act. I'm afraid I don't understand. No? Well, let me put it this way. This belief that Demetrius uh, died a poor man, is that likely? Your gang must have made a lot of money for him. Very great deal. And he was not the sort to let it go, was he? So do you know what's in my mind, Mr. Peters? I am wondering if you killed Demetrius for his money. Mr. Leiden, I think you are very indiscreet. Do you? And also very fortunate. I just suppose I had killed Demetrius. Shouldn't I now be forced to kill you too? Oh, sure. So you did bring your gun. Yes. <laughs> I lied to you a moment ago, I admit it. I was curious to know what you would do. Well, now you know. Mr. Leiden, even if you cannot be indiscreet, at least try to use your imagination. Is it likely that Demetrius and Nick will win in my favor? No. Then how could I put my hands on his money? People no longer keep their wealth in treasure chests, you know. No, I suppose they don't. Then what motive would I have to kill him? Come now, Mr. Light, let us be sensible. I know you disapprove of me. <laughs> I really cannot blame you. But since we must do business together, let us cultivate at least the illusion of friendship. Shall we dine together tonight? Very well. Excellent. Afterwards, we'll have coffee in my apartment. And then, Mr. Lydon, you shall know everything. Everything? Everything. It's an honor to have you here, Mr. Lydon. Such an excellent dinner, too. <laughs> Tell me, how do you like me, this place? Your place? Oh, I noticed the name on the door was, uh, Godfrey. A friend of mine. He's away at the moment. Oh, I see. You conclude, I suppose, that I am Godfrey. <laughs> well, uh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lydon, you're rather naive. But let us get to our business now. I have a picture here in this drawer. Ah, here it is. Tell me, do you recognize it? Oh, of course, that's Demetrius. Yes, I thought you'd say that. Is there any reason why I shouldn't? One slight reason. It's not Demetrius. What on earth do you mean? I mean, this is a photograph of Constantin Gullis. In Istanbul, in a morgue, I, I uh, saw it. Uh, perhaps I'd better explain. When he who had, when we who had been betrayed <coughs> were released from prison, Demetrius had disappeared. Yeah. Gullis spent years tracking him down. And when he found him, Demetrius acted first. He invited Gullis on a cruise. And murdered him. It's Gullis' body that you saw. Then uh, Demetrius is alive. Alive and flourishing right here in Paris. That is why you have come, Mr. Leiden. Me? Our friend has assumed another name, of course. He is fabulously rich. He moves in the very best circles. Director of several prominent banks. It should be worth something to him to protect his position. It should be worth precisely one million francs. Mm -hmm. Blackmail. You choose to be vulgar? I choose to have no part of it. I'm afraid you forget. I know, I know. You still have your gun. Yes. You see, Demetrius may want proof. He might ask you to describe the body. No, you are insane to cross a man like that. Once he knows where you are. But he doesn't know. In my note to him, I specified that the money should be delivered to a messenger at Versailles. Hmm? The messenger will take a route, devious, and meet us several miles from here. <laughs> it's almost time now. Shall we go? <laughs> Mr. Peters, do you really think he'll pay? Of course. I haven't the slightest doubt. No, I, I have a feeling it's, it's too easy. The great things are always easy. Listen, the car. Yes, it's a Renault. That's it. Savard. Good. I have it. I have it. Is it here? Isn't it beautiful? Lawrence, thousand franc notes. Well, then it appears that you have won. 
Mr. Peters, I, I don't think you'll need me any longer. But, Mr. Lloyd, your share. I never intended taking any part of it. Yes, I can understand that you would think that way. <laughs> but at least you must help me count it, my friend, and help me celebrate. A bottle of champagne, the very best. A great vintage year, say 1919 or 1920. A hundred francs a bottle. I insist. <laughs> you insist? Yes, I insist. Well, now here we are, back home, safe and sound. Sound, perhaps, but I, I'm not so sure we are safe. Mr. Delighted, you are cautious, aren't you? <laughs> but perhaps wisely so. I must confess to you, even if you had demanded your share of this million, I doubt if you would have gotten it. I was aware of that. <laughs> then we can drink as friends. Now, here is the champagne, and all we need is some ice. I'll get it from the kitchen. It won't take... Demetrius! You don't flatter me by looking so surprised. You must have known I was not entirely stupid. Listen, Demetrius... What a fool you were to send your note by messenger. It was so simple to trace him to... Don't move, Peterson. You either, sir. No, Demetrius. Put down that gun. I'll give the money back. Go away. I... Oh, no. Another one. Another one. And now you. No, not me. Don't shoot! No! I'm sorry. I, I had to do it. Lighten. He's down. Gun. I've got it. You see this, Demetrius? I have your gun. If you move, I'll shoot. I think you would. Look here. If you shoot me, you'll only get one million. Release me and I'll give you another as well. Please, go get the police. But then he'll get away. I have my gun. All right. No, monsieur, wait. If you go, he'll shoot me. Don't you see that? Why not take my offer? I shall be back with the police. I'll give you three million. Watch him, Peter. Five million, monsieur. I'll be back as fast as I can. No, he couldn't. Peters, you said you would only... Peters! Dead. Both of them dead. <laughs> so this is the end of Demetrius. This is the end of the story. Peters, you didn't live to know it, did you? You didn't live to open your champagne. All right. I'll open it. I'll drink to you. I'll drink to you. Because I have my story now. Because... Huh? What's this? Champagne sec, 1934? <laughs> Five francs the bottle in any cafe. I should have known that, Peters. I should have guessed. You cheated even on the champagne. <laughs> Thank you, Peter Lorre and Sidney Greenstreet, for your fine performances in tonight's play. The Lady Esther Screen Guild players are grateful for your appearance here because, as you know, the benefits from these programs go to support the fine work of the Motion Picture Relief Fund and its country house. And now, before we tell you about next week's play, here is a word from one of America's best-known beauty authorities, Lady Esther. I've always said, seeing is believing. That's why I ask you once again to make the Lady Esther patch test. I want you to see with your own eyes exactly what happens when you apply Lady Esther for purpose face cream. I want to prove how much fresher and lovelier your skin will look than it's ever looked before. You can make this simple test in the time you count 30. Just rub Lady Esther face cream on one side of your face. Then wipe it off and run your fingers over that patch of skin. Feel the difference. Feel how smooth and silky it's become to your touch. Now apply your powder and see the difference. See how the dull, drab look is gone. How your skin has taken on new life, new beauty. You see, Lady Esther Face Cream does all these four things. One, it thoroughly cleans your skin. Two, 
it softens your skin. Three, it helps nature refine the pores. And four, it leaves a perfect base for powder. Does the face cream you now use do all these things? I don't care what you pay for it. Even if it's ten times as much as Lady Esther face cream, I still say, make the patch test and compare. See with your own eyes how very much more Lady Esther face cream does for your skin than any cream you've ever used. See how it instantly beautifies the tone, texture, and entire appearance of your skin. Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will present Flesh and Fantasy. It will star Ella Raines and Charles Boyer. Be sure to listen. Peter Laurie is currently appearing in Hotel Berlin. Sydney Green Street will soon be seen in Pillow to Post, both Warner Brothers productions. In last week's program, Dennis O'Keefe appeared through the courtesy of Edward Small Productions and can now be seen in their latest picture, Brewster's Millions. Music on tonight's program was arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Truman Bradley speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, I definitely want to get my hands on uh, the VHS of that, or hopefully they'll be kind enough to release a DVD soon. It's a fascinating story, and Lori actually did a pretty good job as the hero here. By the way, if you have our app or the premium site, uh, we have an extra for you, and this one also features Sydney D uh, Green Street. It's an episode of the Screen Guild Theater. Uh, the star is Humphrey Bogart in an espionage adventure across the Pacific. So listen to that if you have the app or our premium site. The app is available in the uh, iTunes store for your iPhone, in the app store for the Android phone, and you can get our premium site access, which gives access to both great detectives of old-time radio and old-time dragnet extras for a uh, tip of $7, and you can click the donation uh, button at greatdetectives.net to do that. Well, that'll do it for now. We'll be back on Monday with the Abbots. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. And remember, every month, please cast your vote for us on Podcast Alley at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. <laughs>